and, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, YTO for, for all the effort he's put into organizing this symposium and, and uh, trying to uh, and bring us together and, and show how many of us there are on campus. That was actually a big surprise to me. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story which starts with this guy, uh, which I don't think needs uh, much of an introduction, uh, one of the founders of, of, of modern biology. And, and something that amused him to a level that he wrote, that it's something that, like, if uh, there was a calf with wolf's head. Um, and uh, so I'm going to tell you about a peloria plant discovered by Linnaeus, and I'll tell you a little bit about epigenetic inheritance and uh, molecular mechanism of this process. Um, and, and I'll finish with, with uh, showing you some impact of, of studies on plants on other organisms. Um, so, so the story starts with the discovery of, 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 of a really weird plant, um, which is, um, and, and that, was, that, that happened when a student in Sweden went home for a break and started collecting plants around his parents' house and, and found this plant, which looks like a linaria. Um, the entire plant looks like a linaria plant, except for the flowers, which are completely odd, very different than flowers normally found on this plant. So you can see it here on the right. This is a, a wild type linaria plant. And actually you can find them here in Michigan. They, they are probably not flowering anymore, but a month ago, I, I, I was actually showing them to my students. Um, and here on the left is this weird flower. Um, and, and Linnaeus called it peloria, which means a monster in Greek. Um, and, and that was really interesting because it challenged the definition of a species because there was, uh, well, uh, a, a sheep and then there was a wolf's head, so the, the peloria plant and flower from something completely different. And it also challenged the concept of inheritance, which was of, of great importance um, to, 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 to biologists at that time. Um, and and it, it attracted quite a lot of attention and actually another famous person uh, a very well-known German uh, writer, um, Goethe, uh, got interested in those plants and he even drew pictures. And these pictures apparently, though I got them from a paper published recently, but they, uh, they, they come, they were drawn by Goethe um, uh, 150 years ago. Um, so so what, what do these really interesting plants do? Uh, so when, th when there is a wild type plant, it gives rise um, to plants with also wild type flowers. So a plant with wild type flowers produces plants with also wild type fl flowers. However, a peloria plant with a different flower morpho morphology gives rise to also peloria plant. So it's a heritable phenomenon. There is a very, well, there is some low rate of reversions where peloria plant gives rise to wild type plants and that's something that Linnaeus noticed and that made him lose interest in this plant entirely because that's what he, he thought that that was actually more of a developmental phenomenon. Um, and and uh, in his later works, uh, he, 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 was, he wasn't that excited about it anymore. However, 250 years later, um, at that, well, the, it became possible to figure out what's going on at the molecular, mo molecular level. So it turns out that flower morphology in this plant is defined by one gene, cycloidea. And when this gene is transcribed and the protein is produced, um, flowers have the wild type morphology. However, when this gene is not active, there is no protein produced, then there are peloria flowers uh, a peloria flowers are being produced. Um, and um, it turned out that wild type and peloria flowers are identical on the genetic level. So the sequence of this gene is exactly identical. However, what is different is the status of DNA methylation. Um, so in wild type plants, the cycloidea gene is not methylated, but in peloria plants, the promoter and, and five prime region of the gene is subject to DNA methylation. So DNA methylation um, is, is a modification of DNA. So metal marks are added to cytosines 
they don't really change physical properties of DNA much. It doesn't change base pairing. The methylated cytosine still base pairs with a G. However, um, this work and, and several other pieces of work in, in various organisms demonstrated that DNA methylation may be a heritable determinant of gene activity. So that's why it's often called uh, as, as an epigenetic modification. So uh, a, a, a mark which is um, heritable and is responsible for heritable effects that are not based in changes in DNA sequence. Um, <coughs> So it, it could be called an epi-allele. So it, Peloria behaves like an allele, sort of. Um, and what, how it could be used, what we could do, is take a Peloria plant, subject it to mutagenesis, and look for plants that revert to wild type. And then, at least some of those mutants could have disruption in the molecular machinery that's responsible for maintaining DNA methylation. So doing this in Peloria would be kind of difficult, and no one, no one, I think no one even tried. However, in Arabidopsis, there are very closely related phenomena, and there are several known epimutants in Arabidopsis, one of them um, uh, called Superman, which has also a different flower morphology, um, and, and, and several others that have been studied over the years. And what all of them have in common is that a DNA methylation is heritable and is a heritable determinant of gene activity. So this mutagenesis allowed um, discovery of mechanisms that first establish DNA methylation, then maintain um, the status of DNA methylation, and ultimately, at least in some cases, remove these metal marks. And this is the work of several labs, and let me acknowledge just uh, just a few of them, uh, Marjorie Marge Matska, David Balcom, Judith Benker, Bender, Jan kang Zhu, and Steve Jacobson. Um, and they have done genetic screens, uh, various types of genetic screens um, that discovers many of those components. Um, and so I'm going to focus today on the mechanism of establishment of those, um, of DNA methylation, um, which is something that my lab is interested in. Um, so it turned out um, that under certain circumstances, regions of the genome could be targeted for silencing. And these tar targeted regions would be, well, mostly transposons, um, which for obvious reasons um, should be inactivated and maintained in the inactive state. Um, how exactly do I recognize that? It's, it's actually a little bit of a mystery. Uh, one thing they have in common uh, is, is the repetitive nature. So it's believed that the repetitive nature of sequence um, is, is being recognized. Um, and the activity of several enzymes, um, uh, including uh, uh, RNA polymerase 4, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and the dicer, leads to production of siRNA, or small interfering RNA. And then siRNA can incorporate into an argonaut protein. And the argonaut protein is really interesting because when it binds to an siRNA, it becomes sequence specific. So it can go back to the genome and recognize uh, loci in the genome which have a sequence complementary to this siRNA. And then mediate DNA methylation on those complementary regions. Um, however, Argonaut doesn't seem to be able to recognize DNA directly. Instead, <coughs> there is a, a, a bit of a, more of a complication. Um, so the target regions for silencing are transcribed by a specialized RNA polymerase, POL5, which produces a long non-coding RNA, and this long non-coding RNA is believed to be a binding site for siRNA and Argonaut. Um, and actually, poly, uh, RNA polymerase 5 and this non-coding RNA is the, the, the focus of what we do in our lab. Um, after Argonaut binds to POL5 transcripts, it recruits a DNA methyl transferase uh, in plant known as, as DRM, and this methyl transferase establishes DNA methylation on this region. And the presence of DNA methylation um, causes repression of other RNA polymerases, the canonical RNA polymerases, so polymerases one, two, and three. 
and that leads to repression of gene expression, and because of that, uh, transposons will not be uh, transcribed, transposon proteins will not be translated, uh, so the transposons will be inactivated. Um, the, the, the process that I was just showing you is actually quite amazingly conserved between most eukaryotes, uh, and it's certainly present in, in fungi and in animals as well. Um, however, it turned out that plants have some really unique properties that make this process uh, really easy to study in plants. Um, and first of all, in plants it's present in most tissues throughout the plant. In animals, the equivalent process known as the pi RNA pathway is restricted to the germline, which makes it a, a pain in the neck to study in animals. And then plants have a very robust development. And mutants um, <coughs> in this pathway are generally viable at this inner abidopsis. Uh, then in animals, most mutants are lethal very early in development. Um, <coughs> and another important point is that in both animals and fungi, this non-coding RNA that I was telling you about, and also siRNA, is produced from Pol2 transcript. So RNA polymerase 2 also produces all mRNA. Uh, so it makes this non-coding RNA very difficult to, to distinguish and essentially impossible to manipulate genetically. In plants, we have two specialized RNA polymerases, one responsible for siRNA production and another one responsible for long non-coding RNA production, and they are not essential. So we can mutate subunits of those polymerases and have plants that do not produce one of those classes of RNA. Um, and we can quite easily use genetic approaches um, to, to, to study the molecular mechanism of this process. Um, so, um, before I finish, um, uh, let, me, let me just briefly summarize that, that uh, I hope I was able to show you that, that knowledge and understanding of, of plants um, is actually something very powerful, and it, it's, it's often a key to understanding molecular mechanisms um, important for plants, and plants impor are important on their own, and also conserved and applicable to other organisms. Um, so, let me acknowledge... Uh, uh, people in my lab, um, and it's uh, already a, an outdated picture, um, and funding from the NSF and the NIH. And let me also acknowledge my colleagues, faculty in, the, uh, in, in our department, Molecular Cellular and Developmental Biology, and there are actually nine of us um, who work on various aspects of plant biology, and not all of them were able to, uh, to make it here today, so I wanted to make sure that you have seen uh, all of our faces. Uh, thank you for your attention. All right, thank you.